Okej, okay. hej allesammans och hjärtligt välkommen till ännu en Facebook Live här på Nordens Ark. Um, så idag kommer vi uh, prata om någonting, uh, prata om ett djur som faktiskt inte finns här på arken eller som faktiskt inte finns någonstans i någon djurpark i hela världen. So I'm going to switch to English now because we're here today with uh, William Robichon who is working with this mystical animal which I just said is, is non, not a species we keep at Nordens Ark or it's not a species that we keep anywhere. Uh, in the world, basically, in captivity. So, I was just wondering if you could just tell us and tell our viewers what is a, what is this animal? <laughs> yeah, its name and uh, its international common name is Saula. Mm -hmm. and it was probably the most surprising zoological find of the 20th century. Um, it's only found in the countries of Vietnam and Laos, in mountains along their border, and it was completely unknown to the outside world until 1992. Um, it's a, quite a large animal. It weighs 80 to 100 kilograms. Um, it's a hoofed mammal, distantly related to, to cattle and buffalo. Um, but it's unlike any animal that scientists had ever seen. Mm. And it was completely unknown to anyone except local villagers until it was discovered during a wildlife survey in Vietnam in 1992. And it just really surprised biologists around the world that an animal this large and this distinctive could go undiscovered that long. Mm. Yeah. So how come, how come you are working with this species? How come you got interested in... Yeah, I've, I've been working in wildlife conservation pretty much my whole life. And I was already in Laos and Vietnam working on wildlife conservation projects there in 1992 when this animal was discovered. Um, so I was already working on projects there for the Wildlife Conservation Society, based in uh, New York City. Yeah. But I was there coordinating their projects in Laos. And when Sao La was discovered, it's found in one mountain range along the, the Laos-Vietnam border called the Annamite Mountains. Um, our team and other biologists quickly started discovering other species that were unknown to science. A new species of rabbit, two new species of uh, deer, a barking deer, a muntjacks, an entirely bizarre new type of rodent, several species of birds. So what we quickly realized that the Anamite Mountains along this border was one of the most important areas for protection, wildlife protection in the world. Mm. And so we really started focusing on that. And gradually as we focused on the Anamites, the animal that became most important to protect because it's the most endangered is this beautiful new species, the mm. Saula. Mm. Just want to remind everyone who's viewing that we are doing Facebook Live so we can ask questions. Uh, while uh, while we are on the air, uh, so since the discovery, it's been ninety two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What have you been up to? What have what have happened with the Saula since then? Have you how many are there in the forest? Do you know? Yeah, the animal is in real trouble now. Um, we've been trying to learn about it. Um, another interesting fact about Saula, it's by far the largest land animal that's known for certain existence. I mean, other than like the snowman or Yeti in Nepal. It's actually never been seen in the wild by a biologist, which is extraordinary. Yeah. We have camera trap photographs of it. We've seen a few captives. You know, we see the remains of dead ones in villages, but no one but local people have yet seen it in the wild. Mm. It's very rare, it's solitary, it lives in very dense forest. And it's under a lot of pressure, not by like local people trying to kill it for food, there's just a lot of hunting for many types of wildlife to feed the commercial wildlife trade, mm. for like animals used in traditional Chinese medicine. So uh, conservation organizations in Laos and Vietnam, they've been working very hard in improving the quality of protection mm. in nature reserves and protected areas to try to keep this poaching out. What we've come to realize for Saula is even though the, the poaching efforts uh, or the, the efforts to protect Saula and other animals against poaching, there's been a lot of progress. The Saula population is now so small and the poaching pressure, poaching pressure is still high enough that the animal is not safe anywhere in the wild. If we're lucky, there might be 200 Saulas mm -hmm. left in the wild. Um, our best guess in the Saula working group, of which I'm part, is there are probably fewer than 100 and nowhere are they safe. Mm. So we've come to the conclusion that the best hope for Saula to save them from extinction is to try to bring some animals in captivity and start a captive breeding program. Mm. And we're gonna do this in partnership with the governments of Laos and Vietnam at a center to be constructed in Vietnam uh, next year in 2018. Because yeah, that 
comes to my next question then, that why, why are you visiting us, visiting us here in Nordens Eik in Sweden? Oh, because it's <laughs> like, you have such, I've been meeting people from Nordens Ark at various meetings and I've just really been impressed by, these are people who know conservation and are dedicated to conservation of wild animals and they know how to do it. Um, you're not really a zoo, you're a conservation organization and I just see the the knowledge, the passion, and the experience in people at Norden's Ark. And to save an animal that we know very little about, there are no Saula yet in captivity anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. we're going to need kind of all the brain power and expertise and experience we can. We need a lot of support. Yeah. And so I was just really happy to have my chance to come visit beautiful Norden's Ark <laughs> on a now in beautiful day, day in fall. <laughs> no, I see the sunlight out the window. Um, Finally. <laughs> yeah, no, it's yeah. been wonderful. Yeah. Um, so this captive breeding center is, um, you said that the plan is to start constructions as soon as right. possible because mm -hmm. you got government on board yes. from both sides. Both right. the, where will this center be and how will it be managed? Okay, we've been allocated land uh, by the government of Vietnam in the administration zone of Bac Ma National Park. Mm -hmm. So it's a national park down in central Vietnam, very close to the Sao Las range because we want to keep the animal you know, in the same environment and weather and habitat that it's used to. Mm -hmm. And there's an administrative zone of the park, um, which really isn't you know, that important for wildlife that the, the park authorities and the government have allowed us to use. And we've assembled an international consortium of some of the top zoo experts in the world at raising rare hoofed mammals in captivity, plus uh, the people who know as best as we do know, Sao La in the wild and where to, to find it uh, to get animals for the captive center. The government of Laos is also on board because we are going to have to probably capture some La Sao Las in Laos and move them across the border uh, to the captive breeding center in Vietnam. Yeah. So this is going to be in some ways a, a two country bilateral cooperative effort between Laos and Vietnam, but then adding in the third component of a lot of support from the international community, mm. especially in the expertise of how to raise, capture and raise animals like yeah. this safely in captivity. There is not a lot of experience for this in Laos and Vietnam. There's more experience of that in the international community. So these three partners are coming together to save this animal from extinction. Because mm. I mean, when, when we're talking about it and we talk about captive breeding, it's sounds very easy but I mean you've been working with the species for so many years and mm -hmm. you've been out in the forest uh, in the Anima mountains and you still haven't seen one I mean you, in the wild yeah so mm -hmm. it, I mean the effort to actually manage what you're wanting to do must be uh, it's quite big yeah it will take a lot of time right yeah. it's not going to be easy no. <laughs> but as someone once said the greater the struggle the greater the triumph Definitely. so Definitely. the way I look at it if um, if sow law conservation was neither important nor difficult, there wouldn't, we wouldn't have to organize this huge effort to no. try it. And the reason we, I think we have been successful in organizing this sort of international effort is everybody realizes that this is important mm. and it's not going to be easy. And we actually have a lot, have to have everyone working together to make it a success. Yeah. So, I mean, you are here, we're a conservation organization, but we're, we're also Sioux, and I know you have many partners within the Sioux community. Mm -hmm. So how, how have Sioux contributed to the Saula conservation, and how can we contribute even more okay. uh, in the future? So the response of the Sioux community throughout the world has been remarkable, because this is an animal that no zoo in the world has in its collection, mm. and no zoo is likely to get you know, anytime soon. But zoos have really responded, both with technical assistance to help us plan how to do conservation breeding of sow la, not to capture them safely from the wild, mm. but also with financial support, because this, this effort is going to be expensive. Yeah. I mean, may no, make no mistake about it, it's no. going to cost a lot of money to do. So I've really been uh, very grateful and um, gratified by how much the zoos in both the Europe, the United States, Singapore Zoo in Asia have really stepped forward to help with this. Mm. And we're due to sign before the end of this year agreements with the government of Laos and Vietnam um, for this conservation breeding program for Sao La. Um, once we sign those agreements, the government of Vietnam says we'll be free to work with them to start developing the facilities and begin the capture attempts for Sao La. Mm that's going to, again, cost quite a bit of money. So we've just launched a campaign in the next uh, about 10 months. We have the goal of raising 
500,000 500, euros more from zoos in Europe and $500,000 from zoos in the United States uh, towards this effort. Yeah. And zoos have responded because um, zoos realize that it's in their interest to demonstrate to their visitors that they're not just about keeping animals for exhibit, no. they're also contributing to the conservation of these animals in the wild. Yeah. And what better way to demonstrate to, this, to, to their public than to be involved in the conservation of a beautiful animal that is only found in the wild. Yeah. It's not about anything in their collection. No. And it's really a wonderful thing, the yeah. support of the zoos. Yeah, I agree, uh, totally agree. So, um, so we have this owl here on an image uh, behind us. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a beautiful animal, uh, spectacular. But have it you is. ever seen a saula? I've seen one captive. One uh, it was a long time ago, in 1996 in Laos. Actually, this beautiful animal, uh, I nicknamed her Martha for various <laughs> reasons. It was. She was caught by local villagers four years after it was discovered from horns and skins in mm. Vietnam. And it was the first adult Saola ever seen by the outside world. Yeah. And she was kept in a small private menagerie um, in central Laos, owned by a general who lived there. And I was in Laos at the time, and I went down and spent like just three weeks watching her and recording her behavior. Mm. Unfortunately, she died after less than three weeks. Mm. Um, part of, there was, you know, she didn't have professional care. This wasn't a professional zoo. It's just a little private menagerie kind of run in an ad hoc way. Mm. And I think her issue may have been dietary in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, after she died, we discovered that she was pregnant with a, a yet little male saula. So it was, it was a very sad day yeah. um, when she died. And there's only been, since that time, we only know of uh, one other saula, two other saulas that have been in captivity, and they also died uh, mm -hmm. quite quickly. But that said, as I said, none of them have been kept with professional care. I mean, none of them kept by like the professional capacity you have at a place like Norden's Ark. Mm. Um, and I think when we have that capacity, working with our partners in Vietnam, this program can be a success. Mm. We're also going to use the program there. As I said, there have been other new species that are very rare found in the Annamite Mountains since the Saula. One of them is a deer called large antlered muntjac. Mm -hmm. It's now also listed as critically endangered on the IUCN red list because it's really getting hammered by this commercial hunting and poaching, especially the setting of these wire snares. So the Conservation Breeding Center will serve two purposes, um, serving as a, a conservation program and captive breeding program for Saula mm -hmm. and also for the large antler and munchak, okay. while there's still time to save it as well. And so the large antler and munchak are still, I mean, they're critically endangered, but they're still... Yeah. You still see tracks of them, yeah. or more, more get, of them. Yeah, we get there's certainly more of them than Sala, mm. or we get more camera trap photographs of them than we are of Sala. Mm. Um, so we're quite confident we can capture some of them probably quite readily. Okay. So, mm. so you you mentioned the threat from the, from the wildlife trade mm -hmm. uh, and the poaching, and you just mentioned uh, snares yeah. as well. Could you just describe the situation in, in these forests? How, how is the situation yeah. for the animals living there? I'll try, but it's difficult to describe because yeah. the scale of it is so intense. Mm. So in response to the demand for luxury wildlife medicines or luxury wildlife meat for restaurants, the prices now for some species of wildlife in Laos, Vietnam, and Southeast Asia are very, very high. Mm. Um, the rural people in these countries often don't have a lot of money, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of income, but for example, there's a, a turtle, a little box turtle, well, they maybe weigh one kilogram found in these forests. A Lao villager can sell one of those turtles to a wildlife trader now for about 20,000 euros for one turtle. Um, and other species have, you know, maybe not prices that high, but in the thousands of euros or hundreds of euros. So commercial hunters, mm. They'll go into these forests and they'll they take uh, like that wire cable that are for bicycle brakes or bicycle gear yep. cable, yep. and they make wire snares out of them meant to catch an animal's foot, and they'll just set thousands of these in a forest at a time, mm. and they just they come back and check them every few weeks, and hopefully they get an animal that's valuable in the trade and hopefully an animal that's not all completely rotted and useless, mm. so an animal gets caught and it spends maybe days hanging in the snare until it dies of stress mm. and thirst. So there's a lot of waste. The interesting thing about Sao La, because the animal doesn't occur in China, 
there's no use for it known in traditional Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it doesn't have a high price in the trade. It has very little price in the trade. So no, poachers are not trying to find the last saulas like they're trying to find tigers and rhinos, yeah. but they set so many snares, and snares are catch anything that yeah. puts their foot in it, that the saula is just being swept up in the general slaughter um, as almost like bycatch. Yeah. You know? So on one hand, that's really sad that this animal's being wiped out with sort of no, no reason. reason. Yeah, but on the other hand, it really gives us a hope to save it. Yeah. Our, in some ways, the, the task of sow law conservationists like us is easier than rhino or tiger conservationists because mm. they're in a race to, with the poachers to the last animals. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, it's, a, um, it's a, a grim picture that you're painting in this mm -hmm. forest and, and the situation for these animals in the wild. So do you, do you think there's hope? Do you think? Sure, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. So please give us some good stories. Give us some. Okay, yeah. I mean, one thing is uh, we've been quite successful at um, working with the governments of Laos and Vietnam to mm -hmm. sort of change the way they do patrolling and ranger patrolling and protection of their protected areas. And with the Sao La Working Group and our partners like the Wildlife Conservation Society and WWF, um, global Wildlife Conservation. We've been sort of collaborating with the governments to focus on five sites that we think are important for Saula in Laos and Vietnam, yeah. and really changing the way that the rangers do the patrolling. And at these five sites since 2011, the, the ranger teams, which are recruited from local villagers who know the forest and can earn money actually saving the forest mm -hmm. rather than you know hunting it, They've collected more than 150,000 wire snares they've removed from the forest since 2011. Mm. And the nice thing is when you, when you remove 150,000 wire snares, you're mm. not just helping Saula, you're helping any animal that's moving on the ground, yeah. these other rare animals that are also susceptible to snaring. So that gives, that gives me hope. Um, so it's getting better. It's still not good enough where we think the Saula are safe. No. Um, Another thing that's helpful is the close political friendship between Laos and Vietnam. They're really working to cooperate together to save this animal. It's mm. really, really a, a special um, natural gift to both countries. Mm. That's great. We actually got, we got a question here. Uh, so it's the Swedish name for the species is Vietnam antelope. Ah, okay. How do you say that in Swedish? Vietnam antelope. Oh, Vietnam, Vietnam antelope. Wow, I can speak <laughs> Swedish now. Only been uh, one day. We just got a question. <laughs> if, is, if this is the species that we talked about, and yes, it is. I'm sure it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you didn't go into that, but it's not actually an antelope. No, no, no. And even, I mean, it's hard to define really what is an antelope. It's yeah. not really a scientific classification, but most of the animals that are considered antelopes are not really related to Saula. No. In fact, it's the scientific genus name that was given, it's called Pseudo-Oryx, mm. like fake oryx, because it superficially resembles the oryxes of uh, Africa and the Middle East with the white spots on the face and the very long horns. Mm. But it's actually most closely related to the family that includes wild cattle and buffaloes. Okay. It doesn't look anything like a cow, yeah. as you can see. <laughs> But it's more closely related to cows than to goats. But it's a very primitive evolutionary offshoot of the line that gave rise to cattle and buffalo. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Question from the room. How large is it? It's hard to tell from the picture. Yeah, they're about 80 to 100 kilograms. Um. Uh, she came up to, she was up to about here on me. Hmm. Yeah. They're solitary. They live in very dense forest. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not a herding animal. No. Um, Villagers say they're very shy, very cautious. Um, one of the, the Lao villagers say they have a nickname for Sao La. They call it the, in Lao, Satsu Pop, which means the polite animal. Because they, and I say, why do you call it that? They say, well, Sao La is not excitable. It just has a very gentle personality and it just walks slowly and quietly through the forest and never gets upset at anything. They say it's very afraid of either the wild Asiatic dog, the dole, or mm -hmm. domestic hunting dogs. It said it's very afraid of dogs, but that's really the only thing that really freaks it out, mm. are dogs. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, I just want to uh, finish with, with the questions. Mm -hmm. So why 
or what does the sala mean to you or why do you mm. want to conserve the sala? I would say it's beauty for me, it's just an element of beauty. Um, and what I say is, you know, people ask this often and um, to me it's, the world would be a less rich place without this animal. So you're right, this animal has no value to humans. Like the ecosystem isn't going to collapse if you lose Sawa. Other things, if Sawa disappears, aren't necessarily going to go extinct. But I don't think we need to make an economic argument mm. of economic benefit to human to save things. Mm. And to me, it's sort of like uh, af I was just after meetings last week in, uh, in, in the Netherlands, and I went to the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam afterwards. And I didn't have to ask the guards at the museum, why are you saving the sunflower <laughs> paintings? <laughs> no, of course we're saving this because yeah. there's this beautiful thing in the world. Yeah. This is this beautiful thing in the world. That's the only reason yeah. that I need. Yeah. So the world would not be as beautiful if it's been a species for eight million years. Yeah. And we have maybe two to five years to save it after mm. 18, eight million years on this planet. And can I give our website address if anybody yes, wants to be involved? Yes, it's uh, savethesaula.org. So savethesaula.org. We will also post this on our Facebook, so anyone who wants to yeah, know more they can, about they can know more. There's a donate button. I mean, we really need. I mean, we're we need money to save this animal, so they can yeah. sign up for a mailing list. Just learn more, make a donation if they like, but just learn more about Sala. Yeah, so. that's great. So with that, uh, we're going to say a very big thank you to William, and I also want to urge everyone to go into the website, donate money, and let's just work together to keep these magical species in the world. Thank you, Emma. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You.